for those of you who don't know me, I go by K. Um, and I participated in True North Insights like community Dharma mentorship program from 2020 through 2022. Um, and during that time and since then, I have been offering meditation instruction about like once or twice a month with, with True North Insight. Um, yeah. So um, we'll start with the refuges and precepts, which I don't know if Daryl's still doing that, but I always appreciate them. So I'll share the screen. And so I invite you to find just, you know, an upright, stable position to, to chant if you'd like, or just listen, no, no, uh, no pressure at all. I know in my practice, it, it took me, it took me some time to feel like comfortable chanting in Pali and to really like digest what, what, what these chants were saying. And so, you know, and I only chanted when I felt like ready and comfortable with chanting. So absolutely no pressure to chant along, but um, I am going to start with the, the homage and refuges. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Udang Saranang Gachami Damang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Budang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Damang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Budang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Damang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami. So these refuges, taking refuge in the, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, I understand as like taking refuge in like the possibility of enlightenment inherent in us all, you know, taking refuge in, in the path in like the skillful ways we can live um, in an effort to be more free and taking refuge in community, the, the community of, of practitioners and like the community of life that we are enmeshed in. I will now recite the, the five precepts, which are, you know, like the ethical guidelines um, these aspirational guidelines that really like aren't at all like commandments in that they're they're not like they're not orders they are they are guidelines to work with um, and they are flexible. Okay, so I'll begin. Anatipata veramani. Sika padang samadhyami. Adina dana veramani. Sika padang samadhyami. Kamisu michachara veramani. 
Sika Padang Samadhyami Musawada Veramini Sika Padang Samadhyami Sura Maraya Maja Pamadatana Veramini Sika Padang Samadhyami Idam misilam magafala nanasa pachayo hutu. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So welcome. Oh, we still have more people arriving. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna do most of the talking after after we sit um, or practice rather. Um, but I just wanted to introduce the theme of the week, which is the the fourth enlightenment factor, um, and it's the factor of joy. Um, and so just, just like feeling into or inviting in joy, whatever that means to you at, at, at the start of our practice. Um, so I invite you to find a, a posture of any kind that will support your practice today, be that, um, be that sitting, sitting, um, standing, if you feel like you might fall asleep, even though it's the morning, who knows, um, lying down, um, and even walking is welcome. You know, typically this is, this is a, a sedentary, you know, like a, we're inviting some sort of immobility, but there are four postures. And so if today you felt like slowly walking as your practice, mindfully walking, that's totally welcome. Um, so finding a posture um, where you can invite like an awakeness and alertness, but where nothing in the body is, is like rigid or tight. You know, if you're, if you're sitting, people are often, often sitting in a way that like the knees are touching the ground or the feet are firmly planted. Um, the spine is 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 upright but again not locked you know the shoulders are relaxed the chest is open you know the heart is open um, bringing in or like inviting a a heart opening in an effort to like welcome joy into into our lives right so finding this like stable rooted posture and taking a full breath and letting it go. And another full breath. And letting it go. Just landing here in the body. in the space you're in and in this, this Sangha together. Like, although we're on Zoom, I like to imagine that we are, are sitting in a circle together. bringing awareness to points of contact between your body and whatever it's touching, the floor, the cushion, the bed, a chair. It's noticing this, this support both from the, the outside and the internal support from your own body, 
the support provided by your your own like skeleton and muscles and all the connective tissue like holding you in the posture that you are in. Now aware that at all times we are supported both from the inside and the outside. It can be helpful to, to choose an anchor for your practice, not required. Some people really like just having a, an open, non-specific awareness, just bringing awareness to, to whatever arises in your practice. If you do want to choose an anchor, you know, common anchors are the breath, you know, watching the wave of the breath as it enters and exits the body. You know, maybe choosing to notice the breath in the chest or in the abdomen, as opposed to the head, because we spend so much time in our, in our thoughts. Or maybe an anchor might be the hands. Noticing any sensation in the hands. Sensation of the hands resting or touching each other. The moistness of the hands or the temperature or any energy you can feel moving in the hands. Or maybe your attention is resting on sound. The sound of your own breathing. sound in the room or sounds outside like these birds I am intermittently hearing chirping this practice time is really an invitation to rest in an aware, an aware, like, uh, sorry, an aware, deeply sensitive body. It's constantly taking in sensory information. just resting in, in open awareness, a wide open awareness. We've already begun, but I'd like to ring the bell three times.
And as the body begins to settle, the mind to collect itself, Is it possible to feel the friendly, supportive presence of present moment awareness? this friendliness that is always there for us to drop into when we take a moment to, to collect the mind and rest. Rest in this subtle joyfulness
The mind produces thoughts. It's, it's nature, it's very alive nature is of proliferation. And in this time of practice, just being aware of that nature. Noticing that thoughts happen. And becoming aware of, of the nature of, of thoughts or really of everything, of the impermanent, unsatisfactory, selfless nature of, of all experience. And resting in present moment awareness. In whatever you're doing at this moment, is it possible to soften just a little bit to allow more joy into your practice?
Bringing awareness to the whole body. Now filling the body with breath. And if it feels accessible to you, seeing if there's any kindness or well being you can offer the body, you can offer yourself. It might be in the form of, of just inviting well-being. Or silently repeating some phrases like, may I be healthy? May I be bathed in love? May I be safe, etc. Or maybe you might just imagine yourself bathed in a soothing, warm light, like a like sunshine. Filling and surrounding the body with well being. And then, if possible, sharing that outwards, you know, radiating it outwards. bringing to mind a person you have a doesn't actually need to be a person a being you have an easy loving relationship with could be an animal could be a beloved plant or a tree or a person of course and offering this being some well-being in whatever form feels feels right to you. And bringing to mind a, a neutral being, someone that you don't know particularly well, that you see around. Someone in the neighborhood or a cashier at a store or a bus driver, or again, a tree down the street, you know, just wishing this being some, some well-being, some kindness. As an energetic offering or as a phrase, you know, may you be safe, may you be well, may you be bathed in love.
And next, bringing to mind, just if you feel like it, a being you have a, a complicated or fraught relationship with. And imagining this being at whatever distance feels okay for you. And offering this being some kindness. Again, as, a, as an energy or as phrases, may you be safe, may you be well. And bringing awareness to yourself and the life and family and community you inhabit. Extending while being into all of this. Into the, the place you live. To all the people and plants and animals and microbes and beyond. And finally, bringing awareness to each other. To this Sangha, to this precious group of people practicing together, supporting each other in our practice, offering some kindness and well wishes to each other. And then letting go of any effort. And just being metta, being level kind, loving kindness effortlessly, just resting in that radiance. So thank you for your practice. I invite you to stretch or take any movement that you need after being still for a little while.
I also invite you, if you feel comfortable, to turn on your cameras. I'd love to see you. Um, okay. <laughs> and your dog friends, your animal friends, love that. Um, so the theme, as I mentioned earlier, the theme of today is is joy or pity in in Pali, um, and it's the the fourth of seven enlightenment factors, which I understand Daryl has been going over, you know, as part of a an ongoing long term study of the Satipatthana Sutta, um, and so the seven enlightenment factors, as most of you know. Their enlightenment or awakening factors, same name, um, are these ordinary yet really wholesome, uh, helpful qualities that live in each of our hearts. Um, and they can be cultivated individually or sequentially. Um, and each one enlightenment factor seeds or conditions the arising of the next one. So I'll summarize the first three that I understand have already been discussed and introduce the fourth. So the first enlightenment factor is mindfulness. You know, being aware in the present moment, you know, having a, an open, soft receptivity of the mind, you know, that, that allows and knows experience as it is. Um, and the second enlightenment factor is investigation. You know, this is the like Vipassana insight piece, um, which means like bringing a, a curiosity or an interest into our, into our experiences um, to, to understand their true nature, right? To understand that our experience is impermanent, unsatisfactory, um, and selfless, right? That there's no like enduring or like findable like essence of self in ourselves or in our experiences. So the, the third enlightenment factor is energy, which means bringing a, a consistent effort, you know, like bringing a wholehearted persistence to our practice. Um, and this is, this is really like, this is a balanced effort that can be sustained long-term. It's not like going so hard that we burn out, right? It's a balanced, sustained effort. Um, and the fourth enlightenment factor is joy. Again, it's called pity in, in Pali, um, also translated as rapture or bliss. And here we're talking about a type of joy that arises in in a meditative state that helps to like uphold or sustain practice. And, and as I mentioned before, like one enlightenment factor um, supports the unfolding of the next one. So being mindful creates the conditions for curiosity or investigation to arise, which then creates the, the conditions for for, an, for energy or sustained effort to arise, which then creates the conditions for meditative joy to arise. And this in turn, you know, creates the conditions for tranquility to arise. I'm just gonna see, I got a note from someone. Someone would like to be unmuted. Um, I will unmute you after the talk. Okay, yeah. Um, and so, right, so one factor seeds the conditions for the next one. And so these, the three factors of um, investigation, energy, and joy are said to be energizing factors and that they bring, they make energy arise in the body. Well, the three factors that come next, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, are said to be calming factors. And the energizing and the calming factors balance each other out with like mindfulness as the base underlying them all. 
And if that doesn't make sense yet, or you're like, what, <laughs> don't worry, it will, like after you've studied all of the enlightenment factors, it will make sense. But anyway, knowing that there's a balance of energizing and calming factors with a under, like with mindfulness underlying them all. Okay, so getting back to joy, right? The topic of the week. The joy we're talking about here is, is related to the joy of present moment awareness, you know, which is like a really subtle joy. And it's, it's like the joy of being enthralled in practice with a collected and curious mind. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, I didn't name Analeo, but Bhikkhu Analeo describes the joy of present moment awareness as like a friendly, supportive practice, you know, that is always there. If we collect our attention and like open to this friendly presence. And he describes joy as an awakening factor, as this same subtle joy of being in the present moment, but just at a more developed stage, like when there's some continuity of practice. And um, for example, Analio describes the joy that arises when the mind is free of hindrances, right? Um, as, and, and so the, the hindrances are sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and doubt. So in those moments when the mind is like collected and curious and doesn't want anything, right? When the mind isn't like desiring something or pushing something away, there can be a joy that's experienced. Or similarly, a joy can arise when the mind is free of ill will or anger. You know, in the mind, when, when in meditation, you're not sitting there like feeling mad at somebody or something, right? Um, or there can be a joy that arises when the mind and body aren't like sleepy and sluggish, when you're not like, you know, fighting off sleep or in French, you know, you talk about like cogne de cru, you know, with your head when you're when you're able to be like awake and present in practice. Um, and similarly, there can be a joy that arises when you're not like preoccupied and worrying about something or when you're not full of doubt. So joyfulness can arise when the mind is free of all of these experiences we have that hinder our awareness, that hinder our experience to be present. Um, and wow, like there can be such a, a joy and a simple relief in just being here now, you know, when there's no contraction of the mind. And we can really rejoice when, when this occurs. Um, I, I listened to a talk by um, Gil Fronsdale in preparing this talk about joy. Um, and he described the five types of joy or rapture that can be experienced in meditation and the physical associations, the physical sensations that can be associated with these. Um, and he talked about like feeling pleasant goosebumps or feeling a surge of energy arise in the body or feeling waves of joy or sometimes feeling like you're floating or feeling a generalized sense of well being in the body, like a sense of well being in every pore. But you know, even if if you if you don't experience these like you know states like feeling like you're levitating or something like that, in listening to this talk by Gil Fronsdale, the the questions that I felt sort of most interested in were about the place of joy in practice, kind of more widely. Like, is joy part of your spiritual practice? Like, how do you cultivate joy in your practice and more widely in your life? Right? And, and I add this question, you know, is there really any difference between cultivating joy in your practice or in your life? Right? Is there any difference really between life and practice? Um, I feel like in practice sometimes, we can take it so seriously that the joy can be lost, you know, being really disciplined, like have to practice every day for 45 minutes or 
yeah, you know, it can be really like tight and rigid and joyless in our practice. And is it possible to, to, you know, still be devoted to practice, but to loosen, to lighten up a little bit, to let more joy in, to be silly in our practice. Um, Gil Fronsdale also talked about the, the classical ways that joy can be cultivated, um, including remembering, you know, the virtue, the goodness of the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Like we, we did the refuges at the beginning, you know, remembering that liberation is possible, remembering that there is a path to liberation and remembering the support that is offered by practicing and just living in community. Um, another way to cultivate joy is to remember your own goodness, right? To remember the moments, even like fleeting moments that you acted kindly, that you acted compassionately, that you acted generously. You know, to, to reflect on like how good it feels to be generous, you know, to make someone a like beautiful dinner and invite them over, to like give someone a ride. Like on Friday night, um, I was I had a lot to do and a friend gave me a just a, a cute little jar of black eyed pea soup. Um, wrapped in a bandana. And I was really grateful to have this soup to eat as part of my dinner. And I thanked my friend and, and they let me know that, that being able to share their pot of soup had brought them a lot of joy. Like the act of being generous had been like really nourishing to them also like so simple, right? Um, so in, intentionally choosing to be around people who are joyful and kind also supports our own joyfulness. You know, and by contrast, like in avoiding people who are like filled with anger or don't act with kindness, you know, is also helpful. And, and I say that like not interpreting this guidance as saying to like avoid conflict or just be like good vibes only, you know, like none of this like bypassing stuff. But but I take, you know, I take this, this guidance as inviting us to have discernment about the relationships we participate in, right? And how they how they affect us, like how they affect our well-being. Right? Like, for example, like a few years ago, I'm not even Christian, but for Lent, <laughs> I decided to, to um to give up relationships that didn't feel energetically reciprocated. And so that meant that some relationships were like, I was always the one like reaching for someone, like asking them to hang out. There were some of these relationships just fell away because without me feeding them all the time, they just died and which I felt some grief about, but also in like the relationships that I still had that remained felt really nourishing and right Right. So this is, yeah, just like one example of discernment in, 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 in relationship. Um, another way to foster joy is to reflect on the abundance and like benevolence of life. You know, for, for example, walking into the woods, I feel a uh, like calming, supportive sense of joy grow in me, you know, even in like Parc du Mont-Royal in Montreal or a city park in New Orleans, you know, in the city, like there's usually lots of people, you can still hear the city sounds. And yet like being in the company of, of trees and all this like plant life, animal life, like cultivates a peaceful joyfulness. And I heard that like Coral Short has been offering these ecosomatic walks um, and, you know, which I think is about like tapping into the joy that can be experienced in nature, the joy and calm that can be experienced in nature. Um, another way to cultivate joy is to reflect on what, what perfect peace could be like, and really believing that it's possible. Um, and there's one more, um, 
inclining the mind towards well-being seeds joy. So this isn't like grasping for well-being, like wanting something to be, but just gently inviting well-being, gently inviting joy into, into life without expectation, you know, softening a little bit to let a little bit of joy, a little bit more joy in, like maybe taking off a piece of armor. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh said, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is a way. And I'll say that again, right? There is no way to happiness. Happiness is a way. And in this quote, I really see the enlightenment factor of joy, right? Like happiness as a way of life, you know, I understand to mean living with awareness friendliness or like the possibility of joy in every moment, right? Like dropping into that gently supportive joyfulness that arises when the mind is collected, curious, free of hindrance, you know, instead of like striving or grasping for the next thing we believe will make us happy, you know, like maybe if I just did this course or if I had this job or this relationship, or if I just moved to the country or to Europe or went on vacation, like maybe that would make me happy. Instead of doing that, just dropping into the joy that is possible here and now, you know, like I understand happiness as a way to mean joyfully being with you know, not, not even striving or clinging to joyfulness that we once experienced, right? Like, for example, maybe the last time I practiced, I experienced a, a like collected energetic joyfulness in meditating. The, the next time I practice, is it possible to just practice without hoping that that particular state arises again? You know, it might, but it, it also might not, you know, and can that be okay? You know, can it be okay to accept what each practice session brings with like the mind of a young baby who doesn't really have expectations? You know? um, I, I see dogs as embodying happiness as a way of life. You know, so often like dogs feel like right here, right now, I didn't have such a joy about like going for a walk, like the same walk they might've been on like every single day for the past five years, right? But like, there's still like a joy about like going on a walk or like this joy when you come home, like so excited to see you, you know? And, and the, the joy that a dog expresses, like it is, it's contagious, you know? It's like, it's so supportive to be in the presence of that joyful warmth. So I'm, I will end with, with a poem by Mary Oliver, which um, to me embodies the collected, curious, energetic joyfulness I've been talking about today. And the poem is called The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is, I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to, how to kneel down into the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is your plan to do with your one wild and precious life?
So with that, thank you again for your presence and your, your attention today. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions and comments about anything that arose for, for you today in practice or, or in general, any reflections you have about joy in practice or in your life. Um, and I will end the recording. <laughs>